And joining us now on the debate in Washington, D.C., Heather Hurlbert, Executive Director of the National Security Network, and Gareth Porter, historian and author of Perils of Dominance. And joining us here in studio, a familiar face, Janice Stein, TVO's Foreign Affairs Analyst, Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. Janice, welcome back to the studio here. Nice to have our guests in Washington on the line. I know that the reaction around the world has so far been, I'm shocked, I'm mortified, I'm appalled, uh, I'm unsurprised, this is not a big deal. I want to go around uh, the table here, literal and metaphorical, and find out what you all thought. So, Heather, initial reaction to the uh, massive dump, if you like, of information secret emails, WikiLeaks as it is. One, it's actually surprising how little we learn that we didn't know or suspect before if you're a, a careful consumer of global news. And two, real dismay about how this kind of airsats openness is actually going to hurt the longer term cause of, of real transparency and declassification. Gareth, your view. I think the documents themselves, uh, for the most part, uh, as Janice has said, do not uh, really change the picture for those who followed uh, the issues that are covered closely. There are a few exceptions, and I, I think one of them is uh, with regard to uh, this question of an Iranian ballistic missile threat to Europe, and that's something that uh, I think has been miscovered in the media, so it's, it's really unfortunate. Okay, we shall pursue that. Janice Stein, what do you think? Um, I, I agree, by and large, not much, although there's texture there. Um, there's analysis of personality. That's actually very, very helpful. Um, secondly, this is not a national security issue, but this wrecks one of our core instruments, which oils global governments all around the world, it throws sand in the gears of diplomacy in a very serious way. Heather, do you think that's right? It throws sand in the gears of diplomacy? Yeah, I really very much agree with that. And, and one of the things I find so stunning about it is that um, both uh, Julian Assange and, and many of the people who've, who've hailed this are people who, who definitely support the use of diplomacy as opposed to the use of force to solve global problems. But as Janice said, this is going to make it much, much more difficult for governments and for individuals to work with each other in a trusting way to, to solve global problems. Well, Andrew Sullivan's not always right, but he's always interesting. And here's what he had to say in the Daily Dish just the other day. He says, overall, I have to say that this brief glimpse into how the government actually works is actually reassuring. The cable extracts are often sharp, smart, candid, and penetrating. Who knew the U.S. government had so many talented diplomats? Gareth, what do you think on that? Well, I, I don't think that's particularly surprising that, that diplom diplomats uh, functioning around the world are doing their jobs, uh, that they're competent in regard to taking good notes um, with, on conversations that they're having with diplomats from other countries. I actually disagree that this is uh, some sort of diplomatic crisis uh, in the world as a result of uh, the WikiLeaks uh, exposure. I think that uh, for the most part, if you're talking, for example, about U.S. conversations with uh, the Chinese or with uh, Turkish diplomats, Turkish uh, uh, officials, they're not really going to uh, be spooked by the fact that these conversations have come out. Uh, and that's because I think uh, the Chinese and the Turks are basically saying things that they're not ashamed of. Um, in their conversations with the United States, and it's not going to be a problem. I think there are some exceptions there as well, and I would say Yemen, for example, we're going to have some problems in our dealings with Yemen, and that's because we asked the Yemenis to lie about uh, uh, the fact that uh, they, they were saying they were the ones who bombed uh, targets in Yemen, and in fact it was the United States. That's a serious problem for them. Yemenis, of course, are denying the whole story to begin with. But Janice, on the Sullivan quote, what do you say? Um, you know, I, I, he, I'm glad he's reassured, Steve. That's <laughs> wonderful. But the purpose of diplomacy is not to reassure Andrew Sullivan. The purpose of diplomacy is to provide exactly what we see in these cables. Not only, it's not only a report on conversations, which suggests this is a transmission belt. But if you don't trust the person you're talking to, the conversations you're going to have are entirely different. What you simply do is echo the public line of your government. If you trust the person you're talking to, you find ways to signal, well, there may be an opening here, or my government's position is this, but it's a little softer. And actually, you know, if you came back and said this, there might be an opening here. That's what the casualty of all this is, because who would do this? Um, 
knowing that there's a reasonably good chance that two years later they're going to be all over the internet. I want to, Heather, would you follow up on that? I think we need to get a, uh, an even deeper understanding of how you believe this could adversely affect diplomatic efforts around the world. Sure, um, and I want to go back to something Gareth said and actually disagree with it because you know the Chinese are so mortified by this that they've actually put up a firewall to try to prevent Chinese citizens from finding out the things that they're diplomats told That's American right. diplomats. Um, similarly, the Arab countries have tried to prevent this from getting into their media because they're so concerned that their citizens learn the truth about the difference between what they say in public and what they say in private. And um, so as Janice just said, you imagine I'm an American diplomat and Janice is a Canadian source and she's going to look at me and think, well, if I tell Heather the truth, about that TV show in Canada, it's going to be in the New York <laughs> Times three days after I, I tell her, and and, and that's a, uh, you know, that's a. Uh, it may be if it's between the U.S. and Canada, and what we're doing is talking about the the quality of various Canadian TV shows. Maybe that's a very minor thing, but now if I'm American and Janice is Chinese, and we need to have an honest conversation about what happens when the crazy government in North Korea collapses. That's a really vital issue for stability and peace uh, really ar around the world. And if we can't have a trustworthy conversation and if we can't report it back to Washington or alternately, if I'm an American and I go to, to Canada and I sit down with a senior Canadian, say, who's been serving in, um, in Baghdad or Tehran or Kabul recently and the person says, look, you need to understand that you all have really got it wrong on X or you need to understand that what X other government is telling you is not true and your country is really missing the boat on this. And if I'm concerned that I can't report that back to Washington in a credible way, then it's possible I just don't report it at all. And, and that's a really dramatic problem in a world as complex as ours. If I can't safely report and talk about, if I don't have a channel to talk about texture and nuance and detail and differing interpretations, we, we can't, we can't, I mean, we have a very hard time governing in a sophisticated way to match the sophistication of the world we're in already and this makes it that much harder. Well since you and Janice are doing so much good undercover work here I'm going to employ her on, on the follow-up to that <laughs> question which is you know this past couple days ago the Obama administration gets a big diplomatic win right? Belarus agrees to give up its stock yes. of highly enriched yes. uranium. Real diplomacy happens successfully Absolutely. in spite of these leaks. Well, I can tell you the, the proximity of those two events tells us one thing, Steve, for sure, that the real diplomacy on that one happened before these leaks. Uh, because these, so uh, looking at that doesn't say that there is not now, uh, boy, a real pulling back from American diplomats in a sense that there is a problem in the system. It might be worth talking about why we have that problem in the system for just a moment. Sure. Um, it, it, and and this, is, this is, we're always fixing the last mistake, mm -hmm. okay? The reason we have this problem uh, in the United States right now is after 9-11. Um, people were very, very critical because crucial diplomatic information was not being shared with intelligence agencies. So they created a single platform called CyberNet. And that made diplomatic cables uh, available to thousands and thousands of people who never had access to this material before. And then one private with a very good jumpstick. Uh, that was the rest of the story. We're probably going to see a reaction against this now in order to put some sort of lock on this material. But that is not going to reassure people. It's very similar uh, and for anybody who's ever talked to a reporter. You start the conversation by saying, this is off the record. And you have a very frank conversation. You have that whole conversation. Then you go back and you give the reporter the one quote that you want on the record. Mm -hmm. But the reporter has all the context. Right. If that reporter betrays you, that's the end. Yeah, you never off. talk to that reporter again. Game over. Game Gareth, over. I'm going to read you something here that James Rubin, the former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs during the Clinton administration, uh, wrote in the New Republic uh, just a couple days ago. He said, by and large, the hard left in America and around the world would prefer to see the peaceful resolution of disputes rather than the use of military force. World peace, however, is a lot harder to achieve if the U.S. State Department is cut off at the knees. And that is exactly what this mass revelation of documents is going to do. The State Department functions mainly by winning the trust of foreign officials, sharing information, and persuading. Those discussions have to be confidential to be successful. Destroying confidentiality means destroying diplomacy. Gareth, I guess I, I want to know whether or not the, um, you know, 
this kind of thing flies in the face of what people on the progressive left actually would like to see happen at the end of the day. Well, I'm, first of all, I want to say that I am sympathetic to the idea that diplomacy should be kept secret uh, as a basic principle. I mean, I think that is useful. I, I, I want to uh, make, make it clear that, that I have no problem with that. Uh, the reality in today's world is that in terms of the major conflicts in which the United States has a, a key role, and the Middle East particularly, uh, where the United States is directly involved in conflicts or has a predominant role to play, uh, or potentially predominant role to play in resolution. The, the U.S. policy really is not a conflict resolving, uh, conflict resolution oriented uh, policy. Um, I mean, all you have to do is look at uh, the issues of Iraq, of Afghanistan, um, of uh, the Israeli Palestinian uh, conflict. The United States has not really played the role of uh, putting peace and conflict resolution at the head of its list of priorities. If that were the case, then this WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks phenomenon would not be seen in the news uh, this week or in the past few months. I mean, the reason for these WikiLeaks uh, is that someone in the U.S. military, clearly one of the 850,000 people who did have access to CyberNet, uh, was completely disillusioned with U.S. policy on the grounds that it was not uh, oriented towards peace, but in fact was oriented towards war. Uh, and so, I mean, I think we have to recognize that that is the fundamental reality, the, the real cause for the problem that we're now seeing. You know, I couldn't, uh, and, and I couldn't I think, disagree with you more, Gareth. And, and if you actually, uh, and that's an argument, you're not the only one to make this argument. This is Janice talking now, Gareth, just in, so you know. Toronto, uh, that argument really um, says that, first of all, it gives one of 850,000 officers the right to make policy uh, with respect to diplomatic cables and with respect to diplomacy. I mean, that's clearly absurd. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it... You know, when you listen to Julian Assange and why he did this and why he's released this. Mr. WikiLeaks. Mr. WikiLeaks himself, he really doesn't have a clue, in all honesty. It, for him, it's a, he says, the, to the extent it's coherent, it is, I don't like government. Um, I believe everything government does should become public. Uh, and it, it's almost, it comes almost from an anarchist perspective. And so I'm going to release all this because I believe in 100% transparency about everything except, of course, for himself, uh, because we can't find <laughs> him explain, right now. You should explain that reference. Well, he's not. He, the Interpol has a, an arrest warrant out for him on wholly unrelated charges, um, nothing to do with the release of these documents. Uh, but that, the, in, in a sense, what this is doing is allowing a judgment of one or two and um, individuals uh, about the direction and the value of U.S. diplomacy. Okay. Let me let Gareth come back at that, and then we'll get Heather on. Well, I mean, I think the, the point I was making is not about Assange, but about the person who made the decision it's to the leak same point, these documents. Though, it had to be... Pardon? It's, I think it's the same point. I don't think you or I would abrogate to private manning um, the right to make decisions about the value of U.S. diplomacy. That's not, that's not appropriate. And I, it's well, well, indefensible, frankly. First yeah, of all, Steve, I mean, bear I, in mind I'll that... I'll jump in it. Hang on one sec. Let's let, let, we have to get, the, let the way, Gareth the way this be, the, the way this began clearly was that, whether it was private Manning or somebody else, uh, somebody was uh, disillusioned with U.S. war policy. Uh, I, I happen to think that the diplomatic cables were not the primary purpose, uh, uh, the primary thought in mind when the person who did this decided to essentially record the entire stream of documentation coming across CyberNet and turn it over to uh, somebody who could then get it out to the public. I mean, it was clearly about the war in Iraq, first of all, and then in, in Afghanistan, secondly. Um, and, and I must say that, uh, that I'm much clearer uh, in my own mind that it is justified in the case of, uh, of the war policies than I am with regard to the diplomatic cables. I, I'm much less uh, convinced that the diplomatic cables uh, tell a story in general that uh, is related to uh, a, a U.S. policy that, is, um, that needs to be exposed. I mean, I think there are some exceptions to that, as, as I said earlier. But for the most part, 
dip these diplomatic cables are, are not really something that uh, serves the purpose of, of peace particularly. And, and in fact, the way it has operated, as the news media have interpreted them, I think it may have the opposite effect. Hmm. Heather, come on in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, first of all, there is a way that we have in democratic societies for people to voice dissent, um, and it's called whistleblowing. And Canadian audiences may or may not be familiar with a guy named Matthew Ho, who served both as a, a soldier and as a diplomat in Iraq and Afghanistan and then quit over principle and has actually had a very effective subsequent career here in Washington, being an exponent of the view that the U.S. should get out of Afghanistan sooner rather than later. And frankly, Matt Ho has had much more influence on the Afghanistan debate than the WikiLeaks Afghanistan tranche did, which came up and disappeared. So, you know, this hasn't even been a very useful methodology of changing American foreign policy. Second, I think I would really not like to live in a world or be associated with an ideology that, um, that lets the ends justify the means in that particular way, the idea that it was somehow appropriate or worthy of valorization to put innocent people's lives at risk, as these leaks have done, um, for the sake of, again, making some diffuse change in policy that no one can really quite define what it is. And last, I think that um, you know, Assange himself has this, this view um, about systems theory and about overloading and crashing uh, not just the U.S., but the sort of global governmental system, as Steve, I think you said. And that, to me, is something that progressives really need to dissociate ourselves from, because we're people who believe in effective government, not in um, undermining and, and um, just destroying government. So I just I think one can have all kinds of quibbles with U.S. foreign policy without thinking that um, this is in any way a productive way to, to change it. Having said that, Janice, help us on this one. Democratic societies, presumably because of things like this, are at an enormous disadvantage compared to, and, and Heather re referenced this earlier, authoritarian societies, uh, Arabic countries, which you know, are democracies in name only, Iran, for example, as well, you add to the list. These are closed societies where th their governments don't have to worry about this kind of thing. Absolutely right. Um, if you look at the media and the societies that you talked about, Steve, um, there is no issue, and they're policy people are able to operate almost with impunity, right, in a way that the leadership in democratic societies can't because you know better than everybody else how often there is a strategic leak by somebody from inside mm -hmm. who wants to inform the public. What happened here, though, is a fundamentally um, different issue. It was an unstrategic dump, as you put it right at the beginning, um, which, and I think the expression I used at the beginning, which throws sand in the gears of the whole diplomatic machinery going forward, which undermines trust in U.S. diplomats. And, the per and, and you know, to, to make one point, which hasn't been made, uh, what's remarkable about this discussion that's going on in the United States, all about the United States, which it always is, <laughs> when, um, but it's not all about the United States. It's actually about um, the future of these diplomats who talk to American diplomats, and now that's known. Well, certainly our Ambassador Crosby has had Our his Ambassador name Crosby, all over the place. but Ambassador Crosby is relatively speaking in a safe position in a safe society. Uh, but takes, you know, take diplomats from smaller countries, um, from uh, not only from Arab governments, but from African governments, because we've seen a, only a small part. The New York Times, The Guardian, and Der Spiegel have been censoring what they've been releasing. They have submitted to the State Department. They've essentially gotten a form of clearance from the State Department. There's been a negotiation, private and secret, by the way, which is not public, hmm. between, the, between the New York Times and the State Department about what gets published and what doesn't get published. But we've seen a tiny, tiny bit of this. Uh, so there are literally thousands of people who are compromised around the world without the protections that exist in the United States. I know that's, that's unconscionable. Well, Gareth, a follow up on that if you would. I know that has been alleged that because, because of this massive document dump that we're calling, uh, you know, there are sources, private sources, secret sources around the world who, whose safety will be compromised Public as a sources, result of this. Diplomats who've been identified publicly. Okay, let's, I mean, that's, that's the allegation, that's the Gareth. Do you, do, you find, do you find that to be true? Well, well, first of all, I mean, I, I have looked at perhaps uh, four dozen or five dozen of the documents, and I have not seen any case myself where that describes uh, the situation in the document. That is to say that some source uh, 
who would, for some reason, not want to, I mean, would, would have reason to be afraid of being identified uh, is, in fact, identified in the document. Uh, diplomats who are working for governments uh, who deal normally with the United States, um, uh, generally speaking, would not be afraid of being named uh, for talking to the United States. I don't quite understand what the issue is there. It's oh, that's not the actually same not true, as, Gareth. It's not, mean, it's not the same as a situation in Afghanistan if you're talking about a, uh, an intelligence informant. That's a different situation. No, I mean, but even if you're talking Steve, about Steve, I'd love to tell you about... If you're talking one about a specific case, case sorry, that I I'm need, aware of. I, I, I got to have one person at a time here. So, Jenna, stand down for a second. Heather, yeah. tell me about the one case you're trying because yeah. we, we, so we, there's go ahead. Yeah, so there's an Iranian businessman mm -hmm. um, who frequently, apparently, travels to Azerbaijan on business, has a particular kind of business, and a, seems to have been talking to American diplomats right. in Azerbaijan. Now, his name is redacted from the cable, the way it was published, but none of the other information about his business, the line of work that he's in, how often he travels there, which will make it enormously easy for any intelligence Absolutely. agency that wants to, to figure exactly out right. who he was, and it's unconscionable that, that that should have been done. Janice, you agree on that? That's exactly my point. Huh. Okay, Gareth, how about that? I didn't see that, that specific document. I'm, I'm prepared to believe that you're correct about that. But I, I really think that that's a, a very much an exception. I don't think that's very frequent uh, frequent. Uh, you know, e even the, the example that Heather mentioned, but let's take uh, other examples. If you have a, a diplomat, that in, in a South Korean diplomat who's critical of his own government and says policies should change, and that's his opinion, or there are differences in my government, frankly. Right. We're not as united as we seem to appear. His own superiors don't know he's saying that. That turns up in a cable. He has serious problems with his own government right now. How do they know he's not just trying to ingratiate himself with the other side? Well, if, if, if they think that he's trying to do that, that's not acceptable from their perspective, Steve. So it doesn't matter what construction you put on it. He didn't have authority to say that. Okay. But there are these friendships across the lines that are built up over time with such difficulty. And it's these people that are all at risk. Heather, let me get you to amplify on something that you wrote earlier this week. And I'll just quote a couple of sentences from it now. In the last few years, you wrote, there has been some progress toward classifying fewer documents and using the more rarefied classifications less frequently. This series of leaks will almost surely reverse that process. Yeah. Tell me what you mean by that. Yeah. Right, so as Janet explained, uh, Janice, I'm sorry, explained after 9-11, there was this effort to create a government-wide um, network in which cables classified secret and below were circulated. Now, an awful lot of what's classified at the lower classifications, frankly, again, is the same stuff you can read in the paper in the mornings. And there's been a slow effort to, to diminish, you know, the habit of sort of retyping the local newspaper and putting confidential on it. Um, now, of course, because a lot of that information is out there and it's embarrassing, even though it's not fundamentally damaging, any time you're a bureaucrat somewhere and you have to decide how to classify something, you're going to want an excuse to classify it top secret or code word so that you can keep it off that network. Um, you're going to want to classify everything you can, frankly, so that you have more tools with which to punish anyone who abuses it or leaks it. And any time someone comes to you and says, oh, we need more openness, you're going to say, ha, remember, WikiLeaks. It already takes decades to get um, classified material declassified here, and, and there's a constant running battle between the State Department and the intelligence agencies over declassification. And this is going to, you know, again, this is going to make it that much more difficult. This is going to make Freedom of Information Act requests that much more difficult, and really set back um, the cause of of knowing more in a in a comprehensive way. Um, what our government does. Because just one other thing that I think hasn't really been mentioned yet is there's this notion that this random flood of data points that we have in WikiLeaks somehow adds up to, to truth. Yeah, and it really okay. doesn't. For truth, you need comprehensivity and you need analysis and you need reflection. And WikiLeaks is no substitute for any of those things. Well, in fact, I think in your piece you said you, you get no more comprehensive truth doing this than you do by downloading the top 20 emails from your inbox right now which is not a bad analogy, actually. Gareth, now you're the, you're the historian here. Yes, please come in on this. Yeah, I want to come in on that precise point because um, I don't disagree that a, a dump of, uh, of this magnitude uh, by itself does not add up to enlightening uh, the, the public. But, but I think we need to come to grips with the second problem that is closely related, and that is that you have a process of selection, obviously, uh, of, of documents that is that involves uh, the news media, 
and a specific set of news media, uh, some of the most prominent newspapers uh, in the world, uh, have been involved in this process. And the judgment that they are making about what is news and how to interpret that news, uh, I'm afraid, has not shown particularly great uh, responsibility uh, or, or uh, judgment about, uh, about what this means. And I'm referring to two stories that everybody has read about, one being the New York Times story about uh, the alleged uh, Iranian acqu acquisition of long-range ballistic missiles that could threaten Europe in the, in the coming years, or already having the missile which could threaten Europe now. Uh, and the other story being that the Gulf shakedoms, including Saudi Arabia, but not limited to it, really agree with the, the Israelis that the United States or Israel should take out the Iranian nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. um, both of those stories are really quite uh, wrong, uh, and they wow. represent uh, either a very uh, uh, cherry-picking of a much broader uh, range of cables and uh, presenting uh, a, a specific line or two as uh, representing uh, the truth. Uh, or simply misrepresenting a key cable, as in the case of the Iranian missile story. Well, let me, let me pick up this uh, issue And of I truth. think that this is a serious problem that WikiLeaks didn't think about. I think that it frustrates uh, certainly what the leakers had in mind uh, and, and does not serve the, the interests of the American people or the people of other countries reading these uh, stories. Let me pick up on this issue of truth with you then, Janice. You know, there, uh, and I'll just pick three random examples. We know that there are elements in the Chinese dipl diplomatic corps that think that the North Koreans are crazy yes. and want to throw them under the bus, as it yes. were. We know that our ambassador in Afghanistan thinks that there's a level of corruption in the Karzai yes. government that is really quite yes. intolerable. We know, as Gareth just said, that you know, there are elements in Saudi Arabia that would be just thrilled if you know, the Iranians were taken out. That's, that's a narrative. Right. But do we know how much truth no. there is there in any no. of that? And I, you know, and I think that's a really important point because I think um, the public is really misled here. Um, a cable is one person's opinion. Now, it, that cable includes reporting on conversations, but they're reporting on conversations with somebody who has an opinion. And they need to send that back because it's one stream of evidence. But it's not policy. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in the newspaper is not only in the three that are doing the editing and the selection, but in newspapers all over that are reporting, is somehow um, the fact that uh, Sheikh Zayed uh, of the Emirates says uh, we need to cut off, you know, we need to take uh, out the Iranian nuclear missiles. That is his view, but that may not be policy. Uh, in the Emirates. We don't know because we're getting this selection. Isn't it good to know, though, that there are elements within the Emirates that think Iran is I think it's bombed? really important that the State Department and the U.S. government know that there are elements, and some of these people are very senior, so this is not random selectivity. Some of these people are very, very senior, and they're identified by name, who would very much like this to happen. But the ultimate policy, the ultimate mm -hmm. judgment has to be made inside the United States when they aggregate all this information together, think about the consequences of doing it, uh, look at the costs as well as the benefit. Okay, but Heather, Heather it, it's, it's one thing for people in high places to know all this information. Why is it a terrible thing for the public to know this information? Well, first of all, there's a way in which this conversation has just replicated the problem that Gareth was referring to, because even in those cable reports, after the high-level personages say that, they then go on to say to the American diplomat, but we'll never say that in public, of course. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of the difference between my saying to you, you know, I wish, um, you know, I don't know, I wish so-and-so weren't in office anymore, or I wish so-and-so weren't my party leader, and my willingness to actually do anything to make so-and-so not my party leader anymore. So, um, you know, the harm, how am going to put this, the harm is not... The harm is not in what people know. The harm in, is in whether there's a frame for people to put the knowledge into. And I think you know, the larger problem that Gareth is referring to is that absent a frame, people put any new bit of knowledge into the frame they already have. So there's just really a global festival of cherry picking going on out of this information as all of us look for little scraps that, that um, correspond to the beliefs we already had. Okay, just a few well, minutes to go here and let me put one last thing on the table. Gareth, forgive me here. We're down to our last few minutes, and I just want to get this last thing, because I know one of you mentioned this earlier in the program. 
uh, the, the story about Yemen's president telling the U.S. General David Petraeus that his country would pretend that American missile strikes against a local al-Qaeda group had actually come from Yemen's forces. And we know Yemen is denying this. So this gets into some pretty nasty business here, as we can tell. And mm -hmm. I guess I want to know, and Gareth, go ahead. You go in on this first. Do you think the public, and this reminds me of that Jack Nicholson movie with Tom Cruise, you know, you can't handle the truth. Is the public really ready to understand which some hard truths? And which public? That's and which public? Go ahead, Gareth, you yeah. start. Well, well first of all, uh, you should understand that that particular story about the fact that the, uh, uh, pre the Yemeni leader uh, Saleh uh, lied for the United States in regard to a uh, cruise missile strike uh, last year uh, against uh, alleged al-Qaeda people or, or related people uh, in Yemen was published actually last uh, spring or summer by the New York Times huh. because I quoted that in a story that I did. This is not really something that's coming out of thin air or coming out of nowhere. Uh, it, it was known publicly, it was published already. But, but I also want to add that, that it's not, uh, th this is going back to the previous point, it's not simply that, uh, that there's no, uh, not sufficient uh, frame for these stories about uh, Middle Eastern shakedoms in Iran. Uh, I have uh, found at least five cables that not only did not say that, uh, that people in these shakedoms wanted the United States to attack Iran, they said the opposite, or they said something very, very hmm. different. Uh, these, uh, these cables, if you look at the entirety, really have a very different narrative. Okay, let me, uh, let me stop you there. For, forgive me, the, Gareth. i got 30 seconds yeah. left, and I want to let Heather have it. Heather, go ahead. Can we handle the truth, actually? So ultimately, what we handle is the truth as gossip. And why have we paid so much more attention to this tranche of WikiLeaks than the previous two? There's so much more gossip in it. Mm -hmm. And that, I find, you know, sort of ultimately, we have all this stuff thrown into our laps, and what do we do with it? We make gossip out of it. You know, what, one seconds. quick question. There's the, the real issue here is what can the Yemeni public handle? And the president of Yemen made a judgment that it was in the interests of Yemen to have this happen. But he did not think the Yemeni public could handle that. I don't think, again, it's the business of somebody in the Department of Defense to make that judgment for him. It's in my interest to say thank you all for this discussion, but we got to go. Heather Hurlbut from the National Security Network in Washington. Gareth Porter, the independent journalist and historian in Washington. Very good of you two to be there on the line from the American capital. Janice Stein, as always, here in Toronto. Thank you so much.